Welcome to Halftime, a show dedicated to equipping and inspiring people to accomplish what God has prepared them for. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm a Halftime alumni, and these webinars are actually part of my Halftime journey. Thank you so much for joining us. Halftime is focused on creating more significance in your life. So if you're feeling a bit that way, or maybe you know someone that's in that season, you can find out more by going to halftime.org. That's www.halftime.org. I'll also include that information at the end of our program. Today, we're discussing leading like it matters to God in times of crisis and assessing your core leadership values as we, we reboot. So I have everybody here, and there we go. So today, we have Lloyd Reeb and halftime alumni Rich Stearns. Now, Rich and his wife, Renee, live in Bellevue, Washington, and have five grown children, five grandchildren, and, and Rich has led two major public companies and one of the world's largest nonprofits over his 40-year career. He's written several books and a bestseller, including The Hole in Our Gospel. Lloyd Reeves is a successful real estate developer, author of three books, and the founding partner of Halftime Institute. Welcome, everybody, <coughs> and I hope everybody is well. Rich, thank you in particular for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, uh, Doug, and I'm looking forward to being with you. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And Lloyd, it's always a pleasure when we get together on screen. How are you today? Great. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for your partnership, as always, and your friendship in doing these. Rich, good to see you. It's been a long journey together. We've been doing these things for many years and in many different places. And Doug, one of the things I love the most about Rich, it, it, second to his passion for the poorest of the poor, is his sense of humor. I'll never forget a time we had an event at our house at the great room at the back of our house. We had maybe 40 people over and he was talking about poverty and the state of poverty and fragile state poverty. It was a decade ago. And, and Rich had just come from speaking at a women of faith conference where there were 12,000 women and rich. And so I don't know if you remember this, Rich, but I said to you, Rich, you spent the whole day with 12,000 women and you, what was that like? So, Doug, he's got a straight face. He goes, well, they tell me that I'm eye candy for the over 70 crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's even truer today. I, I noticed that not only do we all like books, but we all like gray hair. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you, Rich. Yeah, it's good well, to be here. I think now, a few years later, I'm eye candy for the over 80 crowd. <laughs> Well, I think we all go the same hairdresser. Uh, so it's, it's, but it's fantastic to ever have everybody here. And I want to encourage everybody that's joined us to continue the conversation. And one of the best ways to do that is down at the bottom of the screen, there is an ask a question field there. You can click on that and submit questions that Rich is going to answer. Well, Rich and Lloyd will answer in the second part of our program. Uh, we're also very interested in your response to our poll because Rich is going to use that to guide the conversation. So the sooner you can click on that, it'll only take just a moment to answer one question in the poll. And we're going to review that in just a moment and get a sense for where our audience wants us to spend our time. And we always love the chat. Please share where you're viewing this from and just share things other than questions there in the chat because the questions need to go in the ask a question field. Lloyd, as we approach our third month of this crisis, we're really beginning to see the implications of COVID on lives and businesses. And now we're really facing maybe even more difficult decisions, possibly the most challenging decisions in our entire lives or career. So it strikes me if there were ever a time for bedrock leadership principles, would it be now? Yeah, you know, I kind of agree with you, Doug, because when crisis hits our organizations, our business and our ministries, it tests the underpinnings, doesn't it? 
And it causes us to question our priorities of what really mattered and what maybe didn't doesn't matter as much as we thought it mattered. And the good news is, though, that crisis can help refine our leadership skills. And it, it, under pressure, often we can allow God to chip away the things that weren't rooted in his lasting and eternal wisdom. You know, I think of the fact that Jesus was the best leader of all time. He built an organization that's lasted for more than 2,000 years, and there's no other organization like that. And so what can we learn in this time of crisis? How can we allow it to shape and chip away at our leadership style and our leadership values and enhance our, our company and our ministry going forward? In this short 30 minutes, Doug and I want to uh, unpack with Doug, with Rich, all that he's been learning over these 40 years leading not only public companies, but now um, one of the world's largest nonprofits being World Vision. Rich has written several great books, but he's just finished one about this topic. I love the title. It's Lead Like It Matters to God with the subtitle, Values Driven Leadership in a Success Driven World. It won't be published right this um, moment, Doug, will it, but later this year. Uh, but this this will give them a glimpse at what you've been learning. Rich, before we jump into those leadership principles, though, I wanted to talk to you about the tough choice you made in your life when you encountered halftime and what that was really like, because now you have the privilege of looking back on it 22 years later. And I have a letter in my hand that uh, I told you that when we were cleaning out, um, decluttering our lives, Linda limited uh, the amount of um, history I can keep about my life to one box. And she took a big marker out and she wrote, this was your life. And uh, so in, in that one box of all the really priceless things in my life is this letter, you know, from you on World Vision Letterhead, 1998. Um, you just took this role. And I want to read an excerpt to take us back and then allow you to unpack how you made that choice and what you think looking back on it. You said, this was to Bob Buford in the Halftime Institute. You said, a friend, a friend sent me your book, Halftime. I found it challenging and provocative, but I never dreamt that a year later I would be leaving my 23-year career in corporate world and joining World Vision as their new president. When I contacted the board, was contacted by the board through an executive recruiter, all my defense mechanisms went into action. Like many businessmen and women, I did not want to give up my position, my status, the prestige that went with my CEO role at Lenox China, America's largest manufacturer of fine china, crystal, and silver. Over the next several months, I agonized and prayed about what God would have me do as a pool of uh, ca candidates for the job became narrower and narrower. Even after the board finally settled in on me, I turned them down because like the rich young ruler, I was being asked to sell everything I had, give it to the poor, and then take up my cross and follow the Lord. You remember, of course, how the parable ended with the rich young ruler going away very sad because he had great wealth. For several weeks, I continued to wrestle with God over this call and remembered that the challenge of your book that made maybe the second half of my life and my career could be played for God. Ultimately, I did call World Vision back and told them I'd accept their job. Let me just thank you for being one of the influences in my life that's helped me make this decision. So, so Rich, take us into, into that journey at a heart level. What was that like? And what, what, what are your thoughts looking back on it now? Yeah. So Lloyd, uh, first of all, I'm hearing my voice feed, feeding back to me from the other side. So I don't know if there's an adjustment Doug can make, but, but let me answer the question. Um, as I shared in the, uh, that letter, I hadn't, remembered what I'd written in that letter all those years ago. So thank you for refreshing my memory. But uh, it was one of the hardest decisions I had ever made. And most of us as Christians, we tend to think um, if God asks us to go and serve and do something, we're going to say yes, right? We want to be open to God's will for our lives. 
but when it comes right down to it and you have that rich young ruler moment where God literally says, I want you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Uh, it goes from a hypothetical concept to a reality that sinks into the pit of your stomach when you realize uh, what it means. So it was a really hard uh, decision. Um, one anecdote I'll share is, uh, as you had indicated, I had actually turned down the job. I, I decided I couldn't do it. I couldn't make that sacrifice. But that very day that I turned it down, I already had a dinner scheduled that evening with the president of World Vision International. And uh, rather than cancel the dinner because he'd flown all the way out to the East Coast to meet with me, in fact, he was on his way back from Mongolia, uh, I had dinner with him. I met him at the airport. We had dinner. I told him the news that he'd already heard that I turned the job down. Uh, but I said, hey, I'm a donor to World Vision, so it's great to meet you and uh, this will have a nice dinner. Well, during the course of the dinner, he pulled out a stack of photographs that he had taken in Mongolia just a few days before. And they were photographs of the children in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, the capital city. And these children live under the steam vents, under the manhole covers. Uh, they're homeless. Uh, they're, they're orphans. Uh, and they live under the streets because in the winter, it gets down to 50 below zero. And the steam vents uh, keep them warm enough to survive. And he shared what World Vision was doing to work with these kids. And uh, I mean, I could just feel my heart churning as he showed me these photos. We finished our dinner that night. I went home, I sat in the kitchen with my wife. And as I was telling her about these kids, I just broke down in tears. I, I just I just lost it. I, God had been pursuing me about this job for months. I had turned it down and now I was seeing these kids uh, and I had this one thought, uh, Lloyd, what if one child somewhere in the world suffers or even dies because I don't have the courage to answer God's call to come to World Vision? And I just didn't think I could live with myself with that question hanging over my head the rest of my life. And so the next day I called World Vision back and I said, if you'll still have me, I've changed my mind, I'm, I'll go. And uh, a few weeks later, I, I quit my job. Um, a few weeks after that, we sold our house. We packed up our family and moved them 3,000 miles to Seattle from Philadelphia. And uh, 30 days after that, I was in the jungles of Uganda wondering what had hit me. Uh, but as I look back, and I know I'm talking to a lot of half-timers who may be wrestling with a decision like this right now in their lives, uh, it is the best decision I ever made as my wife often says the only place to be is in God's will for your life. So whatever that is, you want to follow that, uh, that call. Um, I got to see the world change uh, through World Vision. Uh, I got to help millions of children over my 20 years at World Vision. I, I traveled to 60 countries and sat in the homes of the widows and the orphans, and I heard their stories and prayed with them. I had an experience that a, a billionaire couldn't buy. Uh, by following the Lord into this ministry. And I got to mentor a whole generation of nonprofit leaders uh, that are now still serving. Uh, two of my guys are CEOs of homeless shelters, one in Washington, one in Seattle. I've got another and, guy that's CEO of a relief organization in New York. And uh, it's just been great to see. But it all started by answering God's call and surrendering uh, to his will uh, for my life. Yeah. And Rich, those, um, those younger leaders, they'll be still leading right long after you and I are gone. And, um, and just think of, uh, just even the, the statesmen that you were at the UN and places like that for representing the poorest of the poor, which doesn't even show up on all these other, what we would call key performance measurements. And then I know that, um, by contrast, I think, uh, Lennox, China just closed their their last manufacturing plant in America, didn't they? I mean, that brand is basically gone. Well, you know, 10 years after I uh, left Lennox for World Vision, I had an opportunity to go back to Lennox to see my former colleagues uh, one day. And we sat in the conference room and they shared with me a tale of woe of what had happened to Lennox since I had left. There had been five CEOs 
uh, each one hired and then fired. The company had been divested and merged into another company. Five of the six factories had been closed. And a week after that day back at Lenox, uh, they declared bankruptcy. And I lost my executive pension, the one thing I had still from Lenox that was going to support me in retirement. And it was almost like God was saying to me, do you see what you were clinging to? You were clinging to this worthless uh, idol uh, that you thought was going to be your security. And uh, I've just taken away your pension. So you remember for sure that you depend on me for your well-being and not uh, anything else. And so uh, it was just great to see that I had made the right choice and it really confirmed what I had done. But yeah, you're right, no. they just closed their sixth factory, uh, I think last week. So, you know, all those things go away, right? And that we're not saying that every successful Christian business leader should leave corporate America um, because we need God honoring leaders in corporate America. I just spent an hour and a half this afternoon with a guy who leads a, uh, an important essential business in our country, he leads it in a godly way, 10,000 employees, and he's all in and it's very clear it's his calling. But what, what, what I hear from you is the, the priceless rewards of really surrender and, and not only what it does, what God does through you when you're open to being used, but what he does in you. And what we're going to go into next is what he's been doing inside and in reshaping Rich Stearns. And, and I'm glad he didn't take away your sense of humor at the same time. So um, I wanted to read an excerpt from your new book that sets up the premise for our conversation today. Um, the beauty of becoming a values-driven leader is not that embracing values does not require is that embracing values does not require you to master an exceptional new skill or techniques. Values-driven leadership is more about character than competence, more about being uh, being than doing, more about pleasing God than man. And then you go on to make the argument that the values a leader embraces are more important than the success they achieve. So, so that strikes me, Doug, as very counterintuitive, even countercultural to what we're, we read and learn in other business programs. D dive into that a little bit. That's the premise of your book. So, so take that apart. Yeah, it's a little audacious to write a leadership book where I make the statement that success is overrated because most people are reading leadership books so that they can become more successful. But, you know, as I look at our world, we live in a success obsessed culture. Um, you know, we, we celebrate the wealthiest athletes, the, the best, uh, the biggest churches, the, the business gurus that have created huge business empires. And we, we just celebrate them in our culture. We're marinating in a success culture and it seeps into the Christian community and to the church as well. But um, you see, I believe that God is not impressed by the things that impress us. He's not impressed with our success. Probably all of us have imagined that day that we'll stand before the Lord and give an accounting for our life. And try as I may, I, I try to imagine standing before God and, and, and telling him what I achieved in my life. But I can't imagine God saying, you know, Rich, you rocked it by becoming a CEO when you were 33. And hey, when you delivered those 20 consecutive quarters of earnings growth at Lenox, you know, the angels sang in a chorus in heaven. You know, I, I just don't think God is going to be impressed by those achievements. Uh, my wife is not even impressed by those things. <laughs> Uh, I think, more importantly, God is going to ask, what kind of disciple was I? What kind of follower was I of, of his leading in my life? You know, in the introduction of my new book, I tell this story about Mother Teresa. Uh, and the story goes that uh, Senator Mark Hatfield from Oregon was visiting Mother Teresa in Calcutta one day. And he looked at the, the sea of humanity outside of her ministry. Uh, the literally tens of thousands of poor that were sick and impoverished and hungry. And he basically said, Mother Teresa, don't you feel like a failure? You, you, there's, you, you can't possibly help all of these people. Uh, you must feel like a failure uh, every day when you, when you get up and go about your work. And she said this to him in answer. She said, my dear Senator, God did not call me to be successful. He called me uh, to be faithful to be faithful. 
not successful, but faithful. And in that one sentence, Mother Teresa turned our paradigm of success upside down, that success is not what we think it is, driving for the outcomes and, and, and getting the goodies that come with it. Uh, but success is really measured in faithfulness to God. Lloyd, when I was at World Vision, I had a verse from 2 Corinthians stenciled on my wall. And in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God is making his appeal through us. In other words, we're God's ambassadors, every one of us. That is our one job, our solo job that God has given us to do, to be his ambassador wherever we're stationed. Uh, whether it's our own business or we're working in another business, we're working in a ministry, we are God's ambassador uh, because Christ is making his appeal to the world through us. So as a result, God is much more concerned about our character than our value and our values than the title on our business card or the size of our 401k or our wealth uh, or how successful we've been. The, the you know, you're in real estate, uh, your big real estate deals are not going to impress God in the end, but what will impress him is the way in which you represented God uh, in the business dealings that you had and the people that were entrusted to your care under your leadership. I want to say one last thing, uh, and it really comes from Bob Buford, who challenged us to go from success to significance. Um, but I would build on what Bob said by saying that we can actually start out with significance. We can find significance in whatever work we're doing, because if you're an ambassador for Christ in your workplace, that's significant. That's significant. Um, and if we are faithful in that, as Mother Teresa said, God may give us success as well. But significance comes uh, first. Faithfulness comes first. And then God may reward us with success. Mm, that's great. Thank you, Rich. Well, you know, I want to dive deeper into those uh, some of the big points in your book that are particularly relevant to those of us rebooting our organizations as we come out of this crisis or as maybe even the crisis deepens and we end up with more complex issues. Uh, but before we do that, Doug, could you take us into the poll? And um, the poll that you do each time really guides our conversation, doesn't it? It really does. And I appreciate we had a lot of people uh, on the poll now. So here's our poll. And if you have not uh, put your answer in there, still, please go ahead. Reflecting on the last few months, which of the following leadership values has been the most difficult for you to live out on a consistent basis? So our choices and answers, the first one is surrender. I feel like I have completely surrendered my life and career to the ministry of God. Courage, leading while overcoming my own fears and uncertainties. Balance, maintaining a healthy balance between my work, my family, my health, and my time with the Lord. Encouragement, using encouragement more than criticism to lead my team. And perseverance hanging in there in the face of difficult challenges. Uh, by far, uh, with almost 50% of the votes, balance, maintaining a healthy balance between my work, my family, health, and my time with the Lord. Uh, <laughs> se second to that is courage. Uh, leading while overcoming my own fears and uncertainties, and, and actually surrenders very close to that, but the, but, Clearly the uh, strongest by far, and it and is growing beyond 51% now, is balance, maintaining a healthy balance between my work, my family, my health, and my time. And we'll focus there. We really appreciate everyone's input on the poll. So, Rich, we've got, you know, about six minutes. So um, pick some of those, you know, the, the balance, courage, and surrender seem to come to the top of the list. What have you been learning in those spaces? Yeah. Well, uh, let me first uh, deal with balance. I'm going to turn my volume down here so I don't hear myself. But I'm going to first deal with uh, with, with balance. Well, I, actually, I want to start with surrender, Lloyd, and I'll, I'll just get right into balance next. But um, I think for a leader, 
uh, the single most important thing that we need to do as leaders is totally surrender to God's purposes for our lives. And, you know, that's easy to say and easy to give lip service to, but it's, it's again, it's that rich young ruler test. If the Lord came to you tomorrow and said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me, uh, what would your answer be? Uh, you know, scripture says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, God may not ever come to you and say, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me, but he wants to know how you would answer the question uh, if he did. And you need to know how you would answer the question if he did. And the beauty of a surrendered leader is that you can go into your business or your workplace with a great sense of peace because now you've given it all to the Lord. So you could say, Lord, COVID-19 is destroying your business right now. Uh, in other words, I'm not worried about it because it's your business. I surrendered it to you. But Lord, help me lead during this time of crisis uh, for your business. Or Lord, your 401k has just shrunk by 25%. And I'm concerned for you, Lord. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to hand it all over to you and, and trust you for the outcome. So that surrender is very important. But let me shift quickly to balance. Um, you know, there's a leadership principle here that a leader who achieves a healthy balance in their lives between work and family and faith uh, will broaden their perspective. Uh, they'll be a more, uh, more balanced leader. They'll make better decisions and they'll set a positive example for their teams. Um, you know, my wife Renee does a little exercise with some of her women's Bible study groups about life balance and life priorities. And some of you probably heard this. If you if you take a glass jar and let's say you have six or eight walnuts, uh, if you uh, and you have a, a jar of sand as well, if you pour the sand in the jar first, then try to put in the six walnuts, you can't do it. The, the walnuts won't fit in the jar. But if you put the walnuts in first, and the walnuts represent the most important priorities in our lives. So it's things like family and faith uh, and, and, and those kinds of issues, friendships and relationships, uh, service to others. If you put those in the jar first, then all of the sand will fit in when you pour it in on top of the walnut. So what you have to do is figure out what are your walnuts in life? What are those things that are non-negotiable that you want to put into your life first? And then you let your work and all of the other things kind of fill in the space around those walnuts or those priorities. But in order to have uh, a balance in your life, you, you have to make some very difficult choices. Uh, quick story. Um, when I was at Lenox and I was the chief operating officer, the CEO called a big meeting to determine the fate of one of our factories. It was our crystal factory in Pennsylvania. And uh, we were struggling financially with that factory. And the, the discussion on the table was, should we close it? Well, there were 25 vice presidents, division presidents, manufacturing heads sitting around the boardroom table. And the meeting went on and on and on and on and on throughout the day. And it was Halloween that day. And I had three little kids waiting at home in their costumes for dad to come home and make good on his promise to take them out for trick or treat. And so at about six o'clock, when it was clear that the meeting was going to go into the evening, <clears throat> I actually raised my hand and the CEO looked up and called on me, Rich, do you have a question? And I said, Jim, <clears throat> I said, today's Halloween. I have three little kids at home waiting for me to take them out trick or treating. So I'm sorry, but I have to excuse myself right now. Uh, would you, uh, bring me up to date in the morning on where we end up today. Well, you could have heard a pin drop in that room because 25 executives thought they just witnessed somebody committing career suicide. Um, but Jim, the CEO, looked up and he said, Rich, I don't have any kids at home right now. And I'd forgotten it's Halloween. You should actually absolutely be with your family. So you go home and be with them and I'll bring you up to date in the morning. And I got up and left the meeting. You see, I made a choice that day to put my family ahead of my career, um, and I knew it could be a risk, uh, but it was actually a choice I had made many years earlier because I made a commitment right at the beginning of my career that my marriage, my faith, my kids, and family would always take precedence over my work. And so if you're going to have a good life, work-life balance, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to make some choices 
that can be difficult choices, choices if you're a younger leader, choices that could even affect your career. Uh, but ultimately, I think the best leaders try to have a balanced life uh, because it makes them better at leadership. So I'll stop there. Um, so, Rich, maybe just take a second on um, on the courage piece, too, because this this particular time, let's take two minutes on that um, before we stop and go to the questions, because this particular next season, I think, is going to really require courage from all of us, not just business leaders, ministry leaders alike. You face times when, you know, you had to raise millions of dollars every day. And if you didn't, kids' lives were at stake. And that requires courage. So what's the bedrock of finding courage? You don't just muster it up. Uh, how do you just how do you find the courage to lead? Yeah. Well, you know, leadership, sometimes I describe leadership like this. It's like driving a bus at 90 miles an hour in the fog at night in a blizzard with no headlights or windshield wipers, while all of the passengers are criticizing your driving skills. That's leadership. <clears throat> and I like that metaphor because as a leader, you're driving into the unknown. You're driving into uh, the future, a future that you really can't see clearly. And so COVID-19 is that in spades. We are driving into a future that we cannot see, uh, and it takes courage to do that. And uh, the importance of courage in a leader is that everybody on your team is looking to you. And your courage or lack thereof is going to influence how they feel about the future, how they feel about their jobs, the company, the organization, and the future. Uh, but if you demonstrate courage, it will help everyone on your team to be braver and to, uh, to do better through a crisis. So courage is critically important. You know, Billy Graham once said this, courage is contagious when a brave man takes a stand the spines of others are stiffened. I love that quote. But you know, courage does not mean we are not afraid. There's an author named Che Richardson who put, put it this way. Uh, courage is not living without fear. Courage is being scared to death and doing the right thing anyway. So we need to just keep trying to do the right things, the ethical things, the thoughtful things, the the, the smart, intelligent moves that we can make to do the best we possibly can in the circumstances. Um, and then we have to trust God for the outcome. Just before Jesus' uh, death, before he went to the cross, this is what he said to his disciples. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So that's a good verse to read from time to time when you're not feeling courageous. Uh, but I think our courage comes out of our faith in God and our trust for him in him for the outcomes. Hmm. That's really, really wise. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I thank you, Rich. And Doug, take us into the questions and, um, and maybe uh, uh, let people go if they have to at the end of our 30 minutes. Absolutely. Uh, we are at the bottom of the hour, and we know some of you have only allocated 30 minutes. So for those that need to run, we understand it. Just know it is recorded, and so you can catch the uh, second half if you would like or if you need to run. Now, also, if you've got a question for Rich, you can submit it in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of the page, and you do not have to be present for Rich to answer it. You'll actually get an email with a unique link that where your question is answered, you don't even have to watch the whole program again. You can click on that link. So we're going to move into the questions. Uh, Rich, our first question is, we are, so we are so focused on the impact of COVID on our own lives. It seems overwhelming. How can we step back and think beyond our own challenges? <clears throat> Well, I think uh, <clears throat> that's a great question because um, a, a catastrophe like this makes us think about, well, we, we worry, right? We worry about our own situation, our own financial situation, our own business, our own family. Uh, we worry about our kids or if we have aging parents, we worry about them. 
Um, but I think, actually think one of the healthiest things that we can do in a crisis like this is to, to, to ask the question, how can we serve others? Um, again, I'll relate it to your work. Uh, yes, you've got worries about whatever your work is. You've got worries about your family. But uh, in that workplace, you can really be a comfort to other people uh, by the way you lead them through this. If they see in you confidence, if they see in you a sense of peace, the peace that Jesus talked about, uh, it will tend to calm them down as well. And uh, so I think uh, as leaders, uh, serving others is actually helps us get out of our own heads. Um, and as we start to think about the people in our care, whether they be our family or the employees that we work with, uh, getting ourselves to focus more on them uh, will help us deal with our own anxieties because we'll feel like we're doing something productive and important and positive in the lives of others. All right. Thank you. Uh, great answer. Next question comes from Tom. Rich, what was the biggest crisis you faced while you were at World Vision? And then how did you manage your way through that crisis? Well, there were so many. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about World Vision is it's crisis are us. And, um, you know, you can look at the, the Asian tsunami, the, uh, the Haiti earthquake, uh, the Chennai earthquake, uh, the AIDS pandemic. Uh, there were so many crises in the world that World Vision had to respond to. Maybe I would just mention the AIDS crisis uh, in the early 2000s. Um, AIDS was a disease that uh, uh, got a lot of publicity in the United States uh, because uh, of the way it uh, became known to us in the gay community here. But what most people didn't realize is that AIDS was eviscerating Africa. A whole generation of men and women were dying of this disease, transmitted heterosexually, leaving uh, 13 million orphan children behind. And so World Vision had to figure out how do we tackle this horrible pandemic, especially on an issue where it was going to be very difficult to raise money. And when I gathered my team together at World Vision and I said, we've got to tackle AIDS in Africa, we've got to respond, uh, everybody started looking at one another across the table, like, who's going to tell this guy, I was brand new at World Vision, who's going to tell this guy that we can't raise any money for AIDS? And uh, you know, one of the marketing VPs said, we're a G-rated ministry, families and children, and this is an R-rated issue, and our donors aren't going to give to this, and the church isn't going to support this, so we shouldn't go there. And this is where, in fact, I think I write about this in my chapter on courage, and I said, well, you know, this is our Esther moment. You know, if we fail to speak up, if we fail to respond at, to, at this time of crisis, then God will raise deliverance for the children of Africa from another place, but he'll take his blessing away from world vision. And I said, if the donors react that way, they're wrong. And if the church reacts that way, they're wrong. And if we don't tell them, who will? And that began a five-year campaign to take the issue of HIV and AIDS to the church and to, uh, to change their mindset around uh, why the church needed to respond with compassion to victims of HIV and AIDS in Africa. Uh, over those five years, we raised several billion dollars <laughs> for AIDS response. Uh, we sent hundreds of pastors to Africa to see for themselves so that their hearts could be changed. Uh, but like a lot of this was considered a lost cause, and uh, it took some courage uh, to stay the course. And there's an incident in my book where I, you know, we took a tour on the road. We went to 18 different cities and we held press conferences, pastor's breakfast, business people's luncheons. So we had a pastor's breakfast in Knoxville, Tennessee, in one of our first stops. We planned for 100 pastors to be there. We ordered breakfast for 100 and three showed up. And of course, my marketing guy said, told you, told you the church wasn't interested in this. It would have been very easy to quit. And that's where perseverance comes in as a leadership value that we did persevere. And by the time we got to Minnesota, a few months later, we had 900 people come out in the middle of a snowstorm for a, a dinner to learn about HIV and AIDS. Wow. 
What a story. (laughs) Tom, that was a fantastic question, but Rich, that was an even more fantastic answer. (laughs) Yeah, and Rich, just think of all the lives that you've touched and impacted. I know you have a little girl that is a special you know, special to, to Renee, you and Renee, right. That you've really invested in over the years. And you, you sort of told me that you broke all the rules by having one special favorite little girl that you've uh, invested in, I think. Um, but she's a, she's a placeholder, isn't she in your mind and heart for the millions of other kids like that? Yeah. So one of, one of the things you realize when your, your job is to help children all over the world that are poor is it's very easy to objectify them and, and really objectify your job. You sit in a conference room in Seattle, Washington, and you're looking at financial statements and fundraising progress, and you're, you're managing your overheads. You're doing all the same things that people do in a for-profit business. And you start to lose touch with the fact that these are real human beings on the other side of our ministry. You know, mm. when I was at Lenox, I had a sign on my desk that said, relax, it's only dishes. It's only dishes. You know, nobody's dying here. Imagine if I had a sign on my desk at World Vision that said, relax, it's only children. It's only children. So um, one of the things I tried to do to make sure these kids were real to me, and I did it with several kids, and Renee and I sponsored probably 15 or 20 kids, but um, this one little girl, Ruth, uh, not a little girl, she was a teenager. I met her in Bolivia. And when she told me her story, it was the saddest story I'd ever heard. I mean, her father had abandoned her at birth. She said, I've never known the love of a father. Um, When I was 18, my mother abandoned me and moved to another country and uh, and left me behind. And I had to live with different friends moving from home to home to find a bed because she said my dream was to become a lawyer. Uh, And she said, World Vision gave me this dream through your advocacy programs. I want to be an advocate for abused women and children in Bolivia. And I have this dream and I know God is going to answer my prayers and he's going to let me become an attorney. Uh, And I'm working three jobs right now. I'm, 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 I'm registering for classes. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but somehow I'm going to do it. And by the end of her story, I was crying, she was crying, the cameraman was crying who was photographing us. <clears throat> and I got in the car after the meeting, the you know, the SUV in the community, and the Bolivian national director was there. And I turned to him and I said, I'm gonna about to break all the rules that we have at World Vision because we're not supposed to help individual children in a, any special way. But I said, I need to help this girl realize her dreams. Uh, I have a daughter the exact same age as Ruth, and she was at Pepperdine University as a freshman. And um, and so I said, I want you to tell me how I can help her. And so what we cooked up was we could open a bank account in Bolivia uh, that would have a joint uh, signature, you know, her signature and a World Vision executive signature. And Renee and I could deposit money in that account to help her with her expenses. So long story short, uh, we did that. Uh, This was not World Vision money, this was our money because this needed to be personal for me. It wasn't, I wasn't gonna use somebody else's money to do this. And we put Ruth through five years of uh, school and law school. And uh, just a year and a half ago, I got her graduation pictures sent to me with her cap and gown. We paid for her room and board, we paid for her tuition. Uh, and she's now uh, working as a legal uh, associate in Bolivia, helping uh, with women's rights and children's rights. But you see, that made it personal to me that this is not, you, you've got to have a dog in the fight, right? And uh, it was a way to help make my job come alive for me. Mm. Yeah, I think every halftime alumni, we, you, you've got to find some way, even if you're working just at a board or a strategy level, to continue to engage your heart and particularly in this crisis to get, to get deeply involved in some way with someone's life. Doug, sorry to interrupt our questions. No. And, and such memorable answers. <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, Alyssa has our next question and this one actually, uh, she posted in from the chat. So I, I think it comes from Linda. 
Rich, do you drill down into those top five values in your new book? Yeah, actually, um, thank you for that question. The, uh, the thesis of this book is why the values leaders embrace are more important than the success they achieve. And I talk about how important leadership is in the kingdom of God and how important leadership is in our world in the early chapters. But what I argue is that um, the beautiful thing about values, values like integrity and courage and perseverance and humility and encouragement, um, these things are free. They don't require you to master any new skill set. You don't have to become Six Sigma certified black belt. Uh, you don't have to have an IQ of 150 to, uh, to be a person of integrity, right? To be an encourager, to be someone of humility and someone who works with excellence. And, and so the first two or three chapters of the book are about leadership in general. And then I cover 17 leadership values and characteristics or qualities that are important for the Christian leader. So each one has its own chapter. There's a chapter on courage, a chapter on humility, a chapter on uh, compassion, a chapter on um, uh, listening, and uh, a chapter on forgiveness and how forgiveness is an important quality for a leader. So, yes, I go into detail on each of uh, 17 different leadership qualities uh, with uh, and I illustrate them with stories from my own career uh, and scripture as well. Uh, They're based in scripture. So. Thanks for that question. That question might have come from my publisher who's trying to get the book uh, <laughs> sold. Well, I, I'm going to have to get a copy with all these great stories. Uh, uh, Linda, thank you for asking that question. Uh, Dawn asks our next question. How do you make sure you are surrendering what needs to be surrendered while also mm-hmm. making timely decisions and taking timely action where you need to do with business and personal financial decisions? Well, look, say that again. Ask that question. That's a complicated one. It, it really is. Okay. So how do you make sure you are surrendering what needs to be surrendered while at the same time you're juggling important timely decisions that need to be done with your business and personal and financial? Hmm. Well, the first part of that question is easy. We're called to surrender everything to the Lord. You know, our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, our money, our our, our hearts. Um, and if we can, and I say in my book that surrender is not a one-time event, like when uh, Grant uh, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. You know, that was a one-time event. Surrender is a lifelong process for the Christian. I mean, I guess another word for it is sanctification. That the, as we become more sanctified and more uh, conformed to Christ, uh, we're surrendering more and more parts of ourselves. And so surrender is something to really almost think about every morning in your time with the Lord, that, Lord, I, I lay everything at your feet. Uh, it's all yours to do it as you please. And just help me to be a better ambassador for you when I go to my workplace now, when you go to that workplace, you do have to make uh, consequential decisions that affect the lives of people. And um, uh, being a Christian leader doesn't mean that you never give anybody a hard performance review. You never do a layoff. You never uh, downsize a corporation. Sometimes those things are necessary for the greater good. Um, but hopefully, as you do those things and you, you do difficult things in the workplace, you do them with integrity. You do them with humility. You do them with compassion. Uh, You do them in a way that considers the human beings that God has placed in your care in that place. Um, uh, You know, uh, somebody once said, uh, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. And uh, so as a leader, you know a lot and you have power and influence, but your, your team needs to know that you care about them first. If they know that you care about them, then they'll follow you over over a cliff. Uh, if you lead with integrity and you lead and they know you that you're caring about them and for them. 
<clears throat> so uh, it doesn't make difficult decisions any easier to make. Uh, you know, I've had to fire people. I've had to do layoffs and downsizing. Even at World Vision, I've had to do that. Um, but hopefully I did it with humanity, with compassion for the people uh, that were affected uh, in a way that was honoring to God. Great. Uh, let's, we'll keep moving, kind of keep it going fast as we're reaching the top of the hour. So Mike has the next most uh, popular question. Rich, how has the last 20 years changed you personally? You know, that, that is another good question. Um, I think about what if I had not accepted the job at World Vision, and I think my life would be much poorer had I made that decision. And I think when we... Uh, when we follow God's will for our life, uh, there's a richness to that. There's the blessings that come uh, with being in the Lord's will and obeying his will, whatever that means for you. It's different for each person. He calls people very uniquely and very differently. Um, but I think one of the things that was remarkable is, uh, you know, when I came to World Vision, I knew nothing about global poverty. I had never been to Africa. I had no theological degree. Um, I'd never done any fundraising. I, I had no qualifications for that job um, other than being ultimately willing to say yes. I, I still wonder to this day why the board selected me because there were candidates who on paper would have been far more qualified than I would have been. Uh, but I remember that first day in my office at World Vision, and I was very emotional at this time because we had given up a lot. We'd given up the big salary, the big house, uh, my corporate Jaguar. We pulled all of our kids out of this great Christian school and moved them to Seattle. And I was convinced that the board would fire me within a year because they'd realize what a horrible mistake they had made. And so when I got to my office at World Vision, I just cried out to God and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do next. It took every ounce of courage I had to just show up today. So if you don't do it, it isn't going to get done because I don't know what to do. And I throw myself upon the mercy of the court. Help me. And I came about as close as I ever have come to hearing God's voice in my ear saying, Rich, I've got you exactly where I want you, helpless and totally dependent on me. Now watch and see what I do and be amazed. And um you know, we are just the vessels, the imperfect vessels that God chooses to work through. But if we surrender, if we say, Lord, whatever I got, you know, it's all yours. It, it looks like filthy rags to me, but it's all yours. And uh, use me, help me, lead me. And uh, what I discovered over those 20 years is things that I never believed I was capable of. I I ended up doing lots and lots of public speaking. I think some years I spoke a hundred times in public events. I hated public speaking. I never thought I would want a job uh, that had public speaking. My high school English teacher would have told you, Rich Stearns will never write a book. I've written four books now. And uh, I don't know where that came from. And I read a page from the whole in our gospel and I say, I didn't write that, the Lord wrote that. You know, You've heard the statement that God doesn't call those who are, who are equipped. He equips those that he calls. And I've learned that to be true. I found that to be that God provided me with what I needed when I needed it at World Vision. And I discovered within myself, my, myself skills, insights, abilities that uh, I would have never known I had had I not followed the Lord in that direction I think of Peter. Peter was probably the most unqualified leader you could imagine in the New Testament. And yet God equipped Peter to the task of leading the first century church. He took this rough old fisherman that had anger management problems and, you know, was too impetuous and too many outbursts. And, uh, and he turned him into the leader that, you know, started the church off in that first century. And he can do that to all of us if we, submit and follow him. Well, uh, what powerful answers or responses. 
And Mike, good question. Uh, looks like we've got two more. And so Bob has the next one. Rich, we often think of and talk about surrender as a singular event, but I wrestle with this on many levels. Are there any particular actions or disciplines that have helped you in your personal surrender? Well, that, that's another great question. You've got some smart people on this phone asking some good questions, but, um, you know, I, 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 well, I, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, the first one's quick. Um, I found that one of the ways of surrendering is tithing. Um, money can get a hold on us. Money and success and salary and bonus and all of those things can, can get a grip on all of us. There's a, there's a chapter in my book called Greedlessness, uh, which is a value that you want a leader who is not greedy for money. You want someone who is without greed, without lust for money. Uh, to be your leader. and um, But uh, when you tithe, you are f essentially saying that money doesn't own me. God owns me. It's his money. And I'm, I'm making it, uh, you know, it's his money to do it as he pleases, and I'm going to give it back to him. So tithing is an important part of surrender. But, you know, I learned something. I've been fired twice in my career. Uh, I actually recommend it. I think it's really good for the character, and it's really good for your walk with the Lord. <laughs> but the first time I was fired, um, I was out of work for nine months. And um, Renee, my wife, said, uh, whatever lesson God is trying to teach you, I hope you will learn it soon and get back to work. And I said, well, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness when God fired him from Pharaoh's household before he got his. She said, please don't take 40 years uh, to, to discover this. So, <clears throat> But what came to me in that moment of helplessness being unemployed and looking for a job it was right before I came to Lenox um, is this old question from my Catholic catechism when I was a child, why did God make me? And it's to know him, to love him and to serve him in this life was the answer to know him, love him and serve him in this life. And that has kind of become my mantra ever since then, because I realized at that moment, uh, you know, I had been president of Parker brothers games and I'd lost that job. But I realized that I could know God, love God, and serve him in my life, even when I was unemployed. I could do that if I was a cab driver. I could do that as a CEO. I could do that in any circumstance in life. And so when I got that job at Lenox at the end of nine months, I came into work that first day. I had a lot of big first days at the office. And I said this prayer. I said, Lord, thank you for this work. Thank you for reinstating me back into a workplace. I'm grateful for it, but I'm not here to sell dishes. I'm here to know you, love you, and serve you in this place. Help me to do that today. And I prayed that prayer pretty much every day uh, for the last uh, 35 years now. And I think it's a way of daily surrender. Lord, today, how can I know you, serve you, and love you uh, in this place? um today and i think that's a good exercise to uh to have rich you know the other thing that i that i see in you is that um you've just made up your mind that you're going to have the grit to share uh with those around you when you're afraid um and when you're when you're at the bottom and you need to surrender to the Lord. And it, it's, it's almost as if you broke the ice and now it's norma normative in your family, for example, and with those around you. And I think of that time that you wrote about in the uh, Seattle um, hotel room, you know, when you're kind of curled up in a fetal position, struggling with whether to do this next, um, take this next step. And I think your son was maybe even a teenager at the time when he uh, came in and found his dad at this place of physical surrender. You, you know, I mean, that's to even put that out there is, is courageous. And so it strikes me that that's a pathway to daily surrender. Is that, is that been true in your life? Well, yes, Lloyd, and I always like to thank Lloyd for bringing up the most humiliating moment of my life, uh, which uh, he's recounting the incident when I 
<laughs> went for my final interviews at World Vision, I was so distraught and so uh, fearful about taking this job that I didn't want. I was like, Lord, take this cup from me. My wife and my son were out with me on that trip and they were looking at uh, schools that the kids could maybe go to if I accepted the job. And uh, I came back after two days of you know long, long interviews where each hour of the day, I got more and more depressed about my inability to do this job. I, I just thought, Lord, I can't do this. Take this cup from me. I don't know anything about this topic. I, I can't go to these difficult places in the world and see human suffering. Don't, don't make me go there. I was, I was like a baby whining. And I literally got back to the hotel. My wife and son were there. I put in my, put my pajamas and I crawled into bed at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I just pulled the covers over my head and I was weeping and crying out to the Lord, uh, uh, pathetically, you know, that take this cup from me. And my teenage son walked in and patted me on the head and said, dad, it's going to be okay. Mom and I are going to go out and get a bite to eat. We'll be back later. <laughs> and, uh, they did. And they came back later. And, but, you see, it was a spiritual battle that was going on because I did not want to let go of my career, my income, my nice house, my prestige and status and all of that. You know, this notion for Christians of dying to self is a real deal. Um, and it's very hard to die to self. Um and uh, that's why I say it's a lifelong process to surrender uh, everything and to die to self uh, before the Lord. And um, so uh, I don't know, sometimes, but sometimes the Lord brings crises in your life for the very purpose of driving you to your knees. And, you know, the times I was fired from jobs drove me to my knees. They drove me into the word. They drove me back to the Lord. Um the call to World Vision drove me. It broke me. <laughs> it drove me to my knees, you know, and it was like, I'll do anything but this. Don't make me go see starving children. Don't make me go into brothels where 12-year-old girls are being sold. Don't make me go into the center of the AIDS pandemic and see people dying uh, before my very eyes. Send, like Moses, send someone else to do it, Lord. And, uh, but in my case, the Lord said, no, I'm sending you, you know, you're the one that I'm calling. So anyways, it's, uh, but thanks again for bringing up the most humiliating moment of my life, Lloyd, uh, to share in public. Rich, it just, you know, when you first told me that, it just, uh, I just couldn't admire you more. And it's mm -hmm. funny in life when we share those weakest moments, our friends around us just respect the heck out of us. So thank you for, I mean, that shaped me and, and I share it with others. I don't share your story, but I share that same lesson with others. Doug, we should wrap up now, if that's okay, because we promised people we'd be done at the top of the hour. Oh, I certainly agree, Lloyd, but this has been so powerful. I, I hate to see it end, but I like what Jerry said there in the chat, because I really feel much the same way. He says, I've found it valuable to increase giving during times of uncertainty. And and I think you've really, really inspired us during this time. So I appreciate that so much, Rich. And, and Lloyd, thank you for leading us through this. And for our audience, thank you so much. Uh, we had such great questions uh, for Rich, and that was fantastic. So I appreciate your time with us today. So if you enjoyed these programs right now, we're doing these just about weekly. Uh, so we look forward to catching you on the next one of these programs. And meanwhile, if you have interest in halftime.org and you're interested in uh, learning more about our organization, you can click on the uh, green button down there at the bottom and get in contact with Lloyd and he can put help answer questions. Or even if you've got questions for Rich, that's a way to get in contact with him. And Doug, one thing about next week is next week, David Miller will join us, who's been a longtime professor at Yale and Princeton after a long career in investment banking. And if you're like many other uh, men and women who are halftime alumni, you have teenage kids and 20 something kids that have come home. They're probably staying at home or been at home and their lives and their hearts and perhaps their faith is disrupted. 
And who better than to give you wisdom about how to engage 20 something year old kids' hearts about deep faith issues than David, who spent the last uh, 17 years doing that every day in an Ivy League setting with really bright kids, many of whom have never really heard the, the truth about God's love and forgiveness. So if you have adult kids, I, I really recommend you carve out the 30 minutes or an hour to listen to David next week. Well, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. And for today, we thank you. Bye-bye.